Micah chapter 5, if you haven't turned there, we're going to be looking at verses 1 and 2. Normally I've been going through the entire chapter, but last time we were together I shared with you that I wanted to take you into uh, Ezekiel last week in it. And I said, you know, it would probably take at least 20 minutes to do that, and seeing that we didn't have the time, I thought, well, you know what, I'm going to introduce our study today by including uh, a brief look into a few verses there in the book of Ezekiel, and we will in a moment be turning our Bibles to Ezekiel 38. So you may want to be aware of that as we're about to look into this passage tonight. But we'll begin by reading verses 1 and 2, and then I'm going to give to you a prolonged reminder and introduction, and uh, then move into those verses and the next time we get together, we'll pick up at verse 3 and continue and conclude the study of chapter 5. But we're just introducing chapter 5 today with a reminder of some of the things that we've already looked at in chapter 4. I'll begin reading at verse 1, reading verse 1 and 2, and uh, get into our study. Now gather yourself in troops, O daughter of troops. He has laid siege against us. They will strike the judge of Israel with a rod on the cheek. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Now, when last together... We were looking at Micah's prophecy concerning future judgments. And he had given us a picture of what we today would refer to as a near judgment. Because he spoke of a judgment that was quickly approaching. And the uh, judgment that he was referring to was Babylonian captivity. We saw that in chapter 4, verse 10, where it said, Be in pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in birth pangs, for now you shall go forth from the city, you shall dwell in the field, and you shall go even to Babylon. There you shall be delivered. There the Lord will redeem you from the hand of your enemies. And so he had prophesied near judgment. He was speaking of the fact that the uh, nation was going to go into what is called Babylonian captivity. Now we know the historic figure of, of King Nebuchadnezzar. And when you study your Bible, you'll see that King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon invaded Israel on three separate occasions, 605, 597, and 586 B.C. And with each successive wave of invasion, Judah was more and more devastated. When you look in the Old Testament book of 2 Chronicles, for example, chapter 36, verses 17 through 20, we read, the Lord brought the king of Babylon against them, the Babylonians, killed Judah's young men, even chasing after them into the temple. They had no pity on the people, killing both young and old, men and women, healthy and sick. God handed them all over to Nebuchadnezzar. The king also took home to Babylon all the utensils, large and small, used in the temple of God, and the treasures from both the Lord's temple and the royal palace. He also took with him all the royal princes, then his army set fire on the temple of God, broke down the walls of Jerusalem, burned all the palaces, and completely destroyed everything of value. The few who survived were taken away to Babylon. They became servants to the king and his sons until the kingdom of Persia came to power. And so 2 Chronicles records how that took place in the invasion and ultimate dispersion of the children of Israel. Now, it had said in verse 10 of chapter 4, that uh, they would be in captivity, but they would be released from captivity. It said, there the Lord will redeem you from the hand of your enemies. And so the prophecy that he is giving is that they will be taken into captivity, but they will also be released from that. So again in Second Chronicles, in chapter 36, verses 22 and 23, it says, In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord came by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, 
All the kingdoms of the earth the Lord God of heaven has given me, and he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who among you of all his people? Who is among you of all his people? May the Lord his God be with him and let him go up. And so God had stated that they would return, that they would be taken out of captivity, and all of this was near future. Now, when we looked at verses 11 through 13 of chapter, chapter 4, in those verses, that refers to the final war that will occur, and it also speaks of the help that will come from the Lord. There are going to be many nations that unite, he says, and they will come against Israel, but God will be their help in that day. He said in verse 11, Now also many nations have gathered against you who say, Let her be defiled and let her eye look upon Zion. But they do not know the thoughts of the Lord, nor do they understand his counsel, for he will gather them like sheaves to the threshing floor. Arise and thresh, O daughter of Zion, for I will make your horn iron and I will make your hooves bronze. You shall beat in pieces many peoples. I will consecrate their gain to the Lord, their substance to the Lord of the whole earth. And so on the one hand, you had near prophecy, a near future prophecy, which related to Babylonian captivity. But on the second hand, you have a picture of what's going to be taking place in the end days. Now, in Zechariah, in the Old Testament, chapter 12, verse 2, God said, Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples, when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. I want to take you to Ezekiel for a moment and look at this in, with a little more detail. Ezekiel chapter 38. Where's Ezekiel? <laughs> Seek and ye shall find. Turn to the left. Ezekiel 38, verses 2 through 8. Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. Prophesy against him. And say, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. I will turn you around, put hooks into your jaws, and lead you out with all your army horses and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya are with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer and all, his, all its troops, the house of Tagarma from the far north and all its troops. Many people are with you. Prepare yourself and be ready, you and all your companies that are gathered about you, and be a guard for them. After many days, you will be visited. In the latter years, you will come into the land of those brought back from the sword and gathered from many people on the mountains of Israel which had long been desolate. They were brought out of the nations, and now all of them dwell safely. I actually was tempted just to give a study in chapters 38 and 39. I'm giving you a brief look by looking at these few verses here, because this is speaking about what is going to take place in the last days. And I wanted to share with you because um, there is a reference to the final war that's going to occur and the help that comes from the Lord. And Ezekiel gives to us some of the nations that will rise up against Israel. And what is interesting about this is the fact that we see these nations in existence today in opposition to Israel, even as I'm reading these, these verses to you. You see, there's a coalition. There's a, going to be a coalition that invades Israel. And this coalition intends to both destroy as well as to plunder the nation. Uh, in verse 12, it speaks about the people that are gathered from all the nations, speaking of the people that are gathered from worldwide. And, and this is something that will take place in what is called the latter times. It occurs 
when they're living in a time of security with no fear of deportation. And so that's one of the reasons why when Ezekiel is writing, and there are those who are, are commenting on this and interpreting this passage, uh, that is one of the reasons why um, we, we understand that the events that you look at here in Ezekiel 38 were not near events, but were rather events that are prophetically speaking of in the last days and what the period of time is that is referred to as Jacob's trouble or the tribulation. You see, this is going to take place during the tribulation. You see, Israel has signed a peace treaty, and Israel will be at that time living securely. At the moment, Israel is not living securely. But there will be a time when Israel will have a false security. When you compare this and you, and you look in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, you'll, you'll see that Daniel 9, 27 prophesies a time when uh, the Antichrist is going to con, uh, confirm a, a covenant with, uh, with many, he, it says, for, uh, for one week. And when we've looked at Daniel 9, 27, We've seen how Daniel 9.27 is referring to not a uh, seven-day week, but is referring to a period of time that is actually a, a week of years. It's speaking of a time of seven years. And so the Antichrist, prophetically, is going to sign a peace treaty with the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel is going to dwell securely for a short time, for the first three and a half years or so of the tribulation. They're going to live in relative security. You see, they have, they're going to be signing a peace treaty with the Antichrist, and it would appear that a portion of at least of that treaty is going to be for them to have the ability to once again be worshiping in the temple and once again to live in a sense of security. And so there is going to be a time when there is security in the nation of Israel. In the prophetic sense, it will take place in the last days during the seven year period called the tribulation. And Ezekiel is speaking concerning the invasion and the invasion of Israel in these last days, speaking of those last seven year period called the tribulation. Ezekiel is speaking concerning that as they are gonna be there and they, uh, the nation of Israel is going to be living in relative security. You see in Ezekiel 38, 11, it says, you will say, I will go up against a land of unwalled villages. I will go to a peaceful people who dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. He's speaking of a time of security. There's going to be a, a false security, and it's going to take place in the last days after the signing of that peace treaty with uh, the Antichrist. But these nations are going to gather together, and these nations are going to invade. And if you're wondering what the reason or motivation behind the invasion will be the, the reasoning is going to be two things. One, it's going to be that they, they want the land, they want all that it has, they want its silver, its gold, its livestock, all of its goods. Um, they, but they also will come with a mentality, and this is what we're going to say. And I'll develop this with you for those who perhaps might have some questions about this. But the motivation, prophetically, I think we see even now being fulfilled in the mentality of jihad. And you'll see this why in, in a moment. I'll show you why I believe that. You see, they're going to want to wipe these people, the, the, the Jews, off the face of the earth. And they're going to want to take all that they have. Now, why are they going to want to come into the land? And why are they going to want to take all that they possess? Something we need to remember is that Muslims believe that any land that was once occupied by Muslims is permanently theirs. That, by the way, helps us to understand what's taking place right now in Europe. Because there are great portions of Europe, all the way to France and into Great Britain now, that are heavily influenced by Islam. We're seeing this at this moment, even as I'm speaking, this uh, mentality that Islam does have, that that people don't seem to understand, especially Americans don't seem to understand, that when, when Islam has taken, when members of Islam have taken a portion of land, have occupied it, that according to the way that they think, that land belongs to them. And all the way back when in Islam began its existence, began to march across the Middle East and into Europe, 
Everywhere that Islam put its foot, everywhere that Muslims inhabited, they believed that those portions of land are theirs permanently. It's one of the reasons why you have problems right now in the nation of Israel, where there are those who will not recognize the, the reality and right for the nation of Israel to exist. And they say it's because they own that land. Anywhere Islam put its foot and occupied belongs to Muslims. That took place in history. I mean, if you took time, I didn't prepare this, so I'm just going to say it briefly. Else I'd give you more dates and facts and figures. But when you go into uh, places like Spain, and you can go into places like uh, the city of Granada, and in Granada, there is a large contingency of, of Moors, of, of, of Muslims who continue to this day to live there. And they believe that that particular city is really in reality uh, owned by, by the Muslims. They went all the way into France. And it was at uh, the Battle of Tours with Charles Martel that stopped the march of Islam uh, into taking, taking the entire uh, European continent. Had Charles Martel not stopped Islam from its march, then today we very well might be practicing Islam ourselves. And so it, it is something that historically, people who read history and study and teach it can, can point out that when Islam enters into a land, Islam believes that they own that land if they occupied it. And so this idea that Israel really belongs to to Muslims, if you will. It's really something that is not, that has no right to exist. This, this idea is accepted by almost every Islamic nation in the Middle East. They believe that they're only regaining what in fact actually already belongs to them. And so when Ezekiel here in chapter 38 is giving a list of nations that line up against Israel in those days, it's interesting to note these nations and, and I'll share a little bit about them. You, you see the nation as, uh, as it says in verse two, uh, son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog. And so Ezekiel is giving a list of nations that line up against Israel in those days. Gog is a, actually a title. The word Gog means high or exalted one. He's of the land of Magog. When you look in the uh, ancient geography, Magog is what is called Central Asia or Scythia. It's the southern part of ancient Russia. When you look at Rosh, Rosh can be translated chief. Some consider the word Rosh to refer to Russia. There are many who believe it is Russia because uh, verses 6 and 15 refer to the far north, which would be or could be Russia. When you see the word Meshach, Meshach and Tubal were sons of Noah, son Japheth, but today, that's modern Turkey. This is speaking of southern Russia as well as northern Iran. It speaks of Persia. It was called Persia until 1935, and then its name was changed to Iran. But in 1979, it became the Islamic Republic of Iran. Now, we know to this day that Iran is the arch enemy of Israel and of the West, and we know that Iran works actively to cause other Arab nations to no longer cooperate with the United States, Israel, or any of our allies. Then you have Ethiopia, Libya, and Tagarma. Ethiopia is Cush. Libya was put, Gomer, and Tagarma. Ethiopia is the land just south of Egypt on the Nile. It's the Sudan. The Sudan is the home of the National Islamic Front. The National Islamic Front were strong supporters of Osama bin Laden when he lived there from 91 to 96. The word put is modern Libya. Modern Libya openly refuses to recognize Israel's right to exist. Gomer was ancient southern Russia and is modern Turkey in an area called Armenia. Togarma is a name for Turkey. So what you have here is a coalition of enemies of Israel that have one thing in common. They are nations that have a Muslim majority. Now, Turkey, Meshach, Tubal, Gomer, well, somebody said this makes a pretty strong argument for Turkey being part of the invasion of Israel. Current circumstances in that country also lend this view, uh, lend this view some credibility. Since the breakup of the Soviet Union, 
Turkey has been gaining inroads into Central Asia, Magog. It is also linked to Central Asia both ethnically and linguistically and has a growing number of political parties that support opposition to Israel, the establishment of a Turkish Islamic Republic, and the worldwide rule of Islam. Now, when I first got saved back in 1970, I started reading books like The Late Great Planet Earth. Some of you have heard of that ancient literature now, but it was new then. There was a big question. There was a big question at that time, and the question was this. How can Russia, which is an avowed, at that time, the USSR, how can Russia, an avowed atheistic government, how can they in any way, shape, or form actually unite with Islam? How is that possible when Islam calls itself the, worship, the worshiper of the one true God? How could a group of people who, who kill infidels, how can they actually be part of a confederation from Russia coming from the north into Israel in those last days when Russia is an avowed atheistic government? How does that happen? You see, the former USSR was led by atheistic communism. So how could these nations, all of these nations that would be hotbeds of Islam, how could they ever uh, be allies of Russia? Well, it's interesting, but Islam is currently the second most widely professed religion in the Russian Federation. According to recent estimates, while there are six million genuine followers of Islam in Russia, there are more than 20 million officially self-identified Muslims. And so the way that that would happen is when you, when you come to realize that you're dealing with a large population of Muslims that are living there in Russia. Now, Ezekiel 38, 3 states, I am against you, O God, O God, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tabal. So this coalition's invasion against Israel is regarded as an, an attack on God himself because it says, thus says the Lord God, I am against you, O God. So this is regarded as when they invade, not simply an attack on the nation of Israel, but God says, this is really, in fact, an attack on me. So the conflict, as Ezekiel is prophesying here, the conflict is really going to be between them and God. And it is God who's going to defend Israel. The huge odds against Israel will be nullified because God is on their side. That's why the psalmist in Psalm 56, 11, uh, that, that verse there could speak so loudly where it says, in God, I have put my trust. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? So God is saying, I am against you. So it's not as if the nation of Israel is going to have the ability to defend itself against the invasion. What God is saying is when this invasion takes place, when these many nations unite against you and enter in against you, which we're seeing the formation of that coalition even as I'm speaking now, and we've been seeing it now for a number of years. We see that this, this book here, Ezekiel being written hundreds of years before the fact, is a prophetic book speaking of things that are going to take place in the far distant future. Yet we see that these things that are being spoken of here in chapter 38 as well as chapter 39 are actually taking place in our day. It's been stated that though there be many books that purport to be religious in context and religious in, in subject matter, there's only one book that has prophecy. That's the Bible. And the Bible is prophesying several hundred years before Christ that these countries that we're seeing right now uniting together in an invasion attempt and, it's, and we see it, all you got to do is watch the news. Many people in our, in our fellowship really don't watch the news too much. But if you do, you will see it almost every day that there is some kind of incursion, there's some kind of problem, there's something forming, there's some opposition. Why the nation of Israel, this small country, this tiny country, small population, surrounded by hundreds, millions of, of people, why? 
Are they so in opposition? We're seeing it happen right now, even as I speak. Iran, Libya, Russia. We're seeing it even as I speak. It's taking place now. There is going to be ultimately an invasion. It will be a coalition against Israel, but God will take that as an attack on himself, and he will defend Israel. Now Micah had said, Arise and thresh, O daughter of Zion. I will make you a, uh, uh, an iron horn. In other words, in that day when all of this is happening, the help will come, but it's not going to come from the mighty United States military or any coalition from Europe. It's going to be com coming from God himself. Ezekiel says in, in verse 4 here in chapter 38, I will turn you around, put hooks into your jaws, lead you out with all your army, horses and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia, Ethiopia, Libya are with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all his troops, the house of Tagarma from the far north and all its troops. Many people are with you. Prepare yourself, be ready, you and all your com companies that are gathered about you, and be a guard to them. And so notice how it says that he's going to put, put, put hooks in your jaws. It's like an animal that's going to be caught. The invaders will not be successful in their plans against Israel. God allows them to enter Israel so that he can visit them with judgment. They will come in fully confident. They will be coming in prepared to conquer, but they will be defeated. So God makes it very clear that these nations will rise up. These nations will have a coalition. These nations will have one thing in common. What we're seeing today is these nations that are a coalition, that are in opposition to Israel, that are ready to invade at a moment's notice, but in the tribulation period, sometime during that period, these nations will unite. They will come against Israel, but they will be defeated. That's what the Lord says back in Micah chapter 4 when he said in verse 13, Arise and thresh, O daughter of Zion, I will make your horn iron, I will make your hooves bronze. They're not going to defeat you because if God is for you, who can be against you? And so that's one of the reasons why, as I see these end days uh, things taking place, and you can turn on back to Micah, as I, as I see these things take place, you know, I, I used to say this um, more often than I do now. I read the last page of the book, I Know Who Wins. I Know Who Wins. I, I remember, uh, as you're turning back to, uh, to Micah, I remember uh, having a, a knock on the door I was a young believer. I was maybe 23 years old, 24 at the time. It's hard to believe <laughs> five years have passed. But, um, yeah. but I, uh, I, I do remember I was living at my parents' house, and uh, there was a knock on the door. And I opened the door, and there were two uh, women, members of the Jehovah's Witness organization. And they had their uh, Watchtower magazines and their Awake magazine. And they, they began to read to me out of the Gospels and, and began to share with me that we're living in the last times and, and began to say a bunch of things to me that came out of their, uh, their theology. And I was a new believer, but even as I was listening to them, I knew that they were off base on this. And, and I remember saying, you know, you're forgetting what Jesus said. He said, when you see all these things come to pass, look up for your redemption draws nigh. I said, instead of you wanting me to be afraid these are things that ought to cause me to be excited and to rejoice because the coming of the Lord is even closer. So instead of being afraid, I rejoice and I look up because the Lord's return is, is soon. Even, he's even at the door. But getting into our study now, in verse 1 of chapter 5, that was your introduction to an introduction. In verse 1, gather yourself in troops, O daughter of, o daughter of troops, he has laid siege against us they will strike the judge of Israel with a rod on the cheek. So when it says uh, in verse 1, gather yourself in troops, O daughter of troops, he has laid siege against us. And all Bible commentators believe that Micah is at this point returning to what would be called the near future judgment 
the time that Babylon will invade. So it's speaking of a siege, a siege that would be referring to Nebuchadnezzar's invasion of Israel. When he uses the term smiting the judge, that would be a reference to a ruler. So that would be King Zedekiah. King Zedekiah was taken captive. In 2 Kings 25, 7, it says, they killed the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes, put out the eyes of Zedekiah, bound him with bronze fetters, and took him to Babylon. And so that's what happened to King Zedekiah. One thing, every time I read that verse where it says, they, put, they killed his sons in front of him and then put out his eyes. Can you imagine the barbarity of something like that? And the last thing that that man saw was the death of his sons. That would be the last thing that he saw that would be registered in his heart for the rest of his life. He saw his sons killed, and then they blinded him. And so that shows you the cruelty. Cruelty is not new. Cruelty is as old as man. When Cain rose up, the scripture says, and, and killed his brother Abel, all the way back in the book of Genesis. The word killed, when it says he killed his brother Abel, is butchered. He slaughtered. It's an act of violence that's being portrayed to us. Not, not a simple, clean word like kill, but a barbaric action of, of murder. And that's what it speaks about. And, and to this day, once again, we see cruelty. I was reading today, and I'm not going to go into this other than say one thing. Um, just today, about Christian young people young boys that were taken by ISIS, ISIS soldiers and they got um, saws, the kinds of saws that you use to cut down trees and slice these children in half for being Christians, for being Christians. Cruelty is not a new thing. Cruelty is as old as man. And so that's what's going to be taking place. There's going to be cruelty. And, and so he is speaking concerning this, and he's saying, smite the judge. It's a reference to King Zedekiah, who was taken captive. Well, in the midst of all of that, and by the way, uh, in, in, uh, from what I understand in, in the Jewish or Hebrew Bible, uh, verse 1 of chapter 5 is normally associated with chapter 4. You come into verse 2, and this you'll see why in a moment I'm going to stay in verse 2. But notice verse 2. After all of this judgment and prophecy that he's speaking about, here's hope. This is our wonderful future. You, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. In the darkness comes the light. And I wanted to spend time with you in the light tonight after speaking about judgment for so long. So that's why we're staying at verse 2, and then I'll pick up at verse 3. So here we go. Notice in verse 2, you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, in spite of what happened to Judah and the kings of Judah, God has a plan. Now what's interesting, I'll develop this with you, it's interesting, when you read your Bible, you see the name Bethlehem. You normally associate just one city, but the fact is <laughs> there are two cities called Bethlehem in the Scriptures. You have one city referred to as Bethlehem that's in the north. It's found in the book of Joshua, chapter 19, verses 10 through 15. It was in the northwest uh, area in Israel, northwest of, of uh, the city of Nazareth. So it's in the north. Here you have the southern city, and that's why it's referred to as Ephratha, because Bethlehem Ephratha is actually just outside of the city of uh, Jerusalem. And so it's referred to as Bethlehem Ephratha. The word Ephratha means fruitful. Now, in spite of the judgment and exile, God is going to provide Messiah, and he'll do so through David's line. 700 years before the fact, God stated that he would provide a deliverer who would be a savior. And though the odds would be against an heir of David being born in Bethlehem, God said that the savior would be. He's saying there will be descendants living in Nazareth and that they are going to go to Bethlehem. 
Now, when you read your New Testament, you know exactly how this took place because Caesar Augustus uh, issued a decree, a census. And we know that two of the descendants of David went down to Bethlehem. These two descendants are Joseph and Mary. And so they were compelled to go down. And as they arrived into the city, they came at the exact right moment. And when they entered in at the right moment, Messiah was born. Now, in Galatians, in chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, it's interesting how Paul put that. He said, when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children at the right time. When the right time came, God's timing is always perfect. One of the things to keep in mind is that you have Mary, and Mary's on the back of this uh, animal, more than likely a, a, a donkey of some sort or something like that carrying her. She's a very, very pregnant young woman, very pregnant, and she's coming down on a long trip. Now, someone said, you know, you know, the donkey could have stumbled over a rock on the road and could have caused her to, to bring forth her child. But, but then again, they said, no, of course that couldn't happen because God had a plan. God's plans are always specific and they're always fulfilled to the letter, to the letter. And so God was saying 700 years before the birth of Christ that this small, inconsequential city called Bethlehem, and we'll look at that in a moment a little bit more, it was going to be the birthplace of the Messiah, a descendant of King David. Even though David's descendants had been taken captive into Babylon, they were going to be released. There were going to be those who were part of his lineage who ultimately it would just so work out that, that there would be a descendants of uh, a Mary as one and Joseph as the other who would be living in a place called Nazareth. And then at the right moment in history, when roads had been built and the pathway was safer because of the Roman invasion and, and the army that, that was occupying at that time, providing actually safe travel for many people, that these people were going to get on this donkey, were going to take this journey. She was going to make it uh, uh, all the way to Bethlehem. And when she's there, she's going to give birth to Messiah. Now, this is the prophecy that was actually explained to the Magi. Remember the Magi, these, these uh, men who were actually from Babylon who had come and uh, approached uh, Herod and had said to him, where is he who has been born king? We've seen his star and we've come to worship him. And uh, it troubled Herod greatly because Herod was not a Jewish man. Herod was, was, was not uh, the, the legal rightful occupier of a throne in that fashion. And so when Herod heard that there was one who was born king, he was upset. And, and we know when we look in our stories through, our, 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 not stories, our, the events as they're revealed to us in Matthew, how that he called his, his uh, religious leaders over and said, uh, this is what I'm being told, tell me what's going on. And they're the ones who quoted Micah. They're the ones who said, oh, it is, it's prophesied by the prophet Micah. And he's quoting this verse here, verse 2. You, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one who is ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. They said the Messiah is going to be born in Bethlehem. And that's how Herod knew. So the, the scripture itself was quoted so that Herod would know where this one would be born. Now, it says here, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, from what might seem insignificant comes the one who is the most significant. We see that in the Lord. I want to make practical application and move on. What seems to be insignificant to man is made most significant by God. There's a a young boy, he's a shepherd. He tends the sheep. There's a battle going on. And he's one of the 
he's just he's small, he's young, and there's a battle going on. And so his father says, I want you to take these supplies to your brothers. They're on the front lines, they're fighting. So this young boy takes uh, the cheese and all and takes it to his brothers and and sees that there's a commotion going on. He's interested in what's happening. So he asks, what's going on? And uh, the people say, well, there's a, a warrior over there who keeps challenging us. He's been saying that he'd fight any one of us. Nobody's, nobody's taken him up. <laughs> You're crazy. That guy's nine foot nine. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Who am I talking about? David. David and Goliath. David. Insignificant. His, his older brother, very handsome, very powerful. You naughty boy. He calls him naughty. He came here to spy out what's going on. What have I done to you, is his response. You know, little David. Insignificant. Runt in the eyes of his brother. Runt in the eyes of Goliath. All of us are runts in the eyes of Goliath. Can you imagine him playing on the Lakers? We could use his height. <laughs> nine foot nine. He just would dunk like that. God has a way of taking that which is least and using it to his glory so that no flesh can brag in his presence. He has a way of doing that. If, if, if I think I'm something, I'm nothing. He's everything. And when you understand that he's everything and you are nothing, he can use you. But when you think that you are quite the prize, much superior to the rest of the people around me, then you're not usable. And I see this as a principle in scripture that I can repeat over and over again just by looking at people and seeing how People who had really an insignificance, there aren't many wise, there are not very many powerful, there are not very many rich who are called by God. Both Jeremiah and Paul say that. So that no flesh will glory in his presence. So that when God does the work, nobody will say, well, of course he did a work through you. Look how big you are. Look how strong you are. Look how well-equipped you are. Look how eloquent you are. Look how intelligent you are. Look how educated you are. Look how handsome you are. You know, when you want to look at somebody who, is, who, who should have had all the attributes of greatness, and you look at King Saul. You don't look at King David. David was handsome and ruddy, but King Saul was head and shoulders above everybody. He came from a good family, and he was wealthy. He was a good-looking kind of guy. He was a big guy, bigger than everybody else. Everybody said, surely the Lord's anointed stands before us. This is the king. But this is a man disqualified because you had another one, a young one by the name of David, who couldn't help himself. He'd go out into a field and he'd look at the stars and he'd say, when I consider the stars, the heavens, these are worse of your hand. He says, what is man that thou art mindful of him, the son of man that thou should consider him? He worshiped God. He was a worshiper of God. He was the sweet psalmist of Israel. He would write songs and sing praise to God. That's the man God can use. The one who was sold out to him. Was he perfect? No. Does God have a way of using even the imperfect? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because when God spoke of David, he said, this is a man after my own heart. Saul's heart was far away from him, but not David's. This man's heart is after me. And that's what God to this day is looking for. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the earth, looking for one man whose heart is completely his, that he might show himself strong on his behalf. God is looking, even to this day, for people he can use. What qualifies you? Insignificance. I am nothing, but you are everything. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. In my weakness, then I am made strong. It's not in my own strength. I don't rise up in this strength of mine. I rise up in the strength of the Lord. And if God be for us, who can be against us? You see? So he's looking for that person. Jesus himself came from an insignificant Bethlehem, thou that art little amongst the thousands of Judah. It's not that you're exceptionally significant. It's that you're insignificant. 
But isn't that the Lord? Isn't that like the Lord? And what's interesting is the word Bethlehem, on top of this, the word Bethlehem means house of bread. That's what Bethlehem means, house of bread. So from the house of bread comes the bread of life. That's the point. Jesus in John 6, 51 said, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. Jesus, the bread of life. Jesus is the only source of spiritual nourishment, and he is the only way that we can have life. So he's saying, when you come to me, you will never hunger. When you come to me, you will never thirst again. Why? Because Jesus, the bread of life, will satisfy your ever, every inner longing. He will. Have you discovered that? Have you discovered? If you haven't, you need to. Have you discovered? A lot of Christians haven't. That's the reason I'm saying it like this. They haven't discovered that Jesus himself satisfies your hunger. They haven't discovered that. It's Jesus plus in their mind. No, it's Jesus only. Jesus alone. Jesus, the bread of life. The one who nourishes us from the inside. If you eat of my flesh and you drink of my blood, you will have life within you. You will never hunger again and you will never thirst again, Jesus said. You see, that's why... When I got saved, I don't know what it was like with you, but when I got saved, I didn't get saved and then two weeks later go out to hear what Buddha had to say. I wasn't interested. That's why I never went in and looked into Islam. I wasn't interested. That's why I never visited other religious belief systems to see what they had to contribute. Wasn't interested. Why? Because in Jesus, I have everything that I need. And that's what Jesus taught us. When you come to him, you never hunger or thirst again. In John 17, verse 3, he said, Jesus said, This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. In Colossians 2, 9 and 10, it says, In him, in Jesus, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power. So from the house of bread comes the bread of life. Notice in verse 2 how he continues and says, Yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel. Come forth to me gives us the understanding that Messiah was to fulfill God's plan. Come to me. In John 6, 48, Jesus said it like this. He said, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. In Hebrews 10, verse 7, it reads, I said, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do your will, O God. So come forth to me gives us the understanding Messiah comes to fulfill the plan of God. He goes on in verse 2, and he says, Whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Whose goings forth have, come, have been from of old. His incarnation speaks of his humanity. He took upon himself human flesh when he was born. In John 1, verse 1, John said, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. John 1, 14, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The beginning was the Word, and the Word became flesh. Again, in Colossians 2.9, once again, in Christ, the fullness of God lives in, human, in a human body. So he's speaking concerning the fact that Jesus Christ not only is incarnated, but he's speaking of his divinity. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. In Isaiah 7.14, it reads, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us or with us, God. Isaiah 9, 6, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulder. His name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. 
So a son is given. When it says a son is given, that gives us insight into his divinity. The child is born, speaking of his humanity, but the son is given because he's from eternity. And that's what he's saying here. He said, the one to be ruler in Israel whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Jesus Christ was born, took upon himself human flesh, but he is God in the flesh. And it speaks concerning his goings forth from of old, from everlasting. Now in Psalm 90, verse 2, it reads, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Now, from everlasting to everlasting is an interesting phrase. It literally says, from the vanishing point in the past to the vanishing point in the future. The vanishing point in the past to the vanishing point in the future. It's another way of saying, you are God with no beginning and with no end. J. Vernon McGee said it like this. He said, just as far back as you can go in your thinking, he is God. He came out of eternity. He is the eternal son of God. And that's what Micah is prophesying. The one who is to be the ruler is God in the flesh. That's what he's saying. Jesus in John 16, 28 said, I came forth from the father and have come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go. To the Father. There was a time when the Lord Jesus Christ was having a conversation, a dispute really, with some Pharisees, some religious leaders. And it's recorded in John 8, verses 56 through 59. Jesus said, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad that you said to him, You are not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? So they thought he was kind of crazy. Come on now, you're not even 50 years old. You're talking about Abraham centuries ago? Please. But Jesus said to them, listen to this, most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Oh, they took up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple going through the midst of them and so passed by. Now I've had conversations in the past with uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Jesus Christ is the first creation of God. You've spoken to Jehovah's Witnesses, and if you do, they will tell you that. They will say to you that Jesus Christ is the first creation of God. And so I, I will use this scripture, before Abraham was, I am, because when he says, I am, ego me in Greek, he is speaking of the self-existing one. This is the identification that Christ, this is the identification that we find when God was speaking to Moses, when God spoke to Moses and said, I am that I am, it's the same thing. When you look in the, in the Old Testament, the Old Testament has the Hebrew, but it also has what is called the Greek translation, also referred to as the Septuagint version. When you look in the Septuagint version and you look into the words in the Greek of what is being spoken of there in the book of Exodus chapter 3, it says, ego emi, it says, I am which is the same word that you find in John 8, 58, when Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. What Jesus was doing was declaring himself to be God, the God of Abraham, and these people understood it. That's why they picked up stones to stone him. Now, when I'm speaking to Jehovah's Witness, I'll say, Jesus, they'll say, Jesus is not God. And I'll say, Jesus called himself God. No, he didn't. Where did he do that? John 8, 58. Before Abraham was, I am. They said, oh, no, 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 no. Um, no, he's, he's not claiming to be God. I said, indeed he is. You find that both in the Septuagint and you see it in the Greek in the, in the New Testament. That's exactly what he's saying. And I've said this to them. I said, listen, when you look in the law of Moses, there are what are called capital offenses. And there are various laws in the Old Testament that are capital offenses, meaning that the death penalty is enacted when you violate these laws. So you can be put to death, I say to him, for idolatry or for false prophecy. You can be put to death for even breaking the Sabbath. You can be put to death for, for adultery, for murder, for bestiality, for a variety of sins. Which one of those laws did Jesus violate? Well, I said, why they wanted to put him to death was because they called him a blasphemer. Earlier in John, they said, 
uh, we're going to stone you because you being a man made yourself out to be God. They made it very clear. They said, what you are doing is you are claiming to be God himself. But guess what? That's exactly who Jesus is. God in the flesh. So Micah is revealing that though he was born in Bethlehem, his goings forth are from everlasting. He is God who in the beginning created the heavens and the earth. You see in John 1, 3, speaking of Jesus, it says all things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. Yeah, we know in the first verse when you look in the scripture, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The Bible makes it very clear that Jesus is God in the flesh. In Colossians 1, 16, by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they're thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers. All things were created by him and for him. So Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. And in this incarnation, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting, in this God with us, we have a Savior who is present with us. For God took upon himself human flesh, and he took upon himself the penalty of my sin. Jesus took upon himself my penalty when he went to that cross and he gave up his life for me. He said, even the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. That's what Jesus did for us. And so when we're looking here in Micah chapter 5, it is that beautiful prophecy that out of the darkness of judgment that he's speaking, where he's speaking of the near judgment when they'll go into Babylonian captivity, the yet future judgment when, when uh, the Lord is dealing with their sin. And then when the nations are to attempt to invade Israel and destroy it, he's speaking of those things. But in the midst of that, this light just shines brightly. Where he's saying, but all is not lost because God loves you and God will be sending a savior and his name will be Jesus. He will be God with you. And this is the one whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. Your God loves you so much that he took upon himself human flesh, that he might suffer in the way that you suffer, that he might die on your behalf so that you could have a relationship with him. So in, in the darkness of judgment, a light shines brightly. Jesus Christ, the true light, who lighteth every man. What a blessing to have a Savior named Jesus.